Okay, so I think we can start. So dear ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you all to the online course on East Caucasian languages organized by the Linguistic Convergence Laboratory of the HSC University, Moscow, Russia. My name is Chiara Nakarato. I'm a research fellow in the lab and the moderator of today's session. Today is the seventh lecture in the series of 13 entitled The Encoding of Evidentiality in East Caucasian, Different Types of Marking and Aerial Distribution. It will be given by my colleague Samira Firheis. But before introducing our speaker, I would like to clarify some organizational issues. Each lecture will be recorded, live streamed on YouTube and stored there afterwards. The lectures will go uninterrupted followed by a question period. Those of you who are joining the lecture via Zoom will be muted throughout the session in the interest of the lecture and sound quality. You may send your questions via the Zoom chat or YouTube live chat. At the end of the talk, I will share my screen with the full list of questions for the speaker to answer them. We apologize in advance that there might not be enough time to address all the questions, but Samira will be able to read them after the talk and hopefully find a way to answer you. So it is my pleasure to introduce Samira Ferheis, a research fellow at the Linguistic Convergence Laboratory of the HSC University in Moscow. Samira's research interests include the grammar of East Caucasian languages, linguistic typology, language variation and change. She has performed fieldwork on several underdescribed East Caucasian languages of the Endic branch and has co-authored grammar sketches of Botlich, Godoberry and Zeoandi which will appear as chapters in a new handbook on, on Caucasian languages edited by Yuri Karyakov and Timur Maisak for Mouton de Groeter. In 2019, she concluded her PhD at HSC University in Moscow and defended a thesis entitled Evidentiality as part of tense aspect in East Caucasian languages. Samira has also conducted research on the ICSIS gender agreement, verbal morphology and lexical borrowing and has published in such high profile journals as Studies in Language, Language Variation and Change, and International Journal of Bilingualism. Samira has taken part in several research projects of the, of the Linguistic Convergence Laboratory, including the Typological Atlas of the Languages of Dagestan, which she currently coordinates together with other members of the lab. Today, Samira will give us an overview lecture on the encoding of, of evidentiality in East Caucasian. Samira, the floor is all yours. All right, thank you, Chiara. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let me try to share my screen. <clears throat> okay, can everybody see, um, see my slides? Yeah, we, we see your slides. Okay. Um, is everything in the frame or not quite? Because I have a feeling that the, uh, that Zoom cuts off part of my slides. Uh, I think it's okay. Do you see the number of the slides? Uh, in the right corner at the bottom? Yes. Yes? Okay. Then I think we're good. Um, <clears throat> okay, yeah, so hello everyone. Um, the topic of my lecture is the encoding of evidentiality in East Caucasian, different types of marking and aerial distribution. Um, so for those of you who are not really familiar with the terminology, um, evidentiality is usually defined as the encoding of information source. So it's a way to specify how people know what they're talking about. Um, for example, through personal experience, a wild guess, uh, hearsay, etc. So here's an example, uh, not from East Caucasian, but from a Nambiquara language, where uh, a speaker is talking about a, a peccary that um, has died, or at least um, here the speaker uses a, a suffix uh, indicating uh, inference. Um, to state that this peccary has died. And in the second clause, they sort of clarify that uh, it stinks 
um, for which they use a different suffix indicating uh, sensory perception through smell. Um, <clears throat> so the direct observation of the smell is then the basis for the inference in the first clause that the peccary is dyed. Now, this seems pretty straightforward, um, but in East Caucasian, usually uh, things are not so straightforward um, because evidential markers, strictly speaking, do not simply tag an utterance with a, a source reference. Um, rather, they determine the speaker's relation to an event in terms of their access to information about it. So this can be very specific in the case of, for example, inference or some kind of marker for direct sensory evidence, um, <clears throat> but it can also be more uh, vague, for example, uh, just generally not directly witnessed. Um, and information source types can be uh, placed on a client ranging from direct to less direct. So here's an overview of um, <clears throat> values that are expressed by uh, evidential markers uh, in various languages. So on the direct end of the client, you have um, active participation or sensory observation, for example. On the indirect uh, end of the client, you have hearsay with several subtypes, uh, inference from results, uh, and inference from reasoning, which is uh, just inference based on, on prior knowledge. Um, so for East Caucasian, the most relevant are the ones I colored pink here. So general indirect evidentiality, hearsay, inference from results, and to some extent also inference from reasoning. Um, although inference from reasoning is already, uh, in my opinion, uh, not quite evidential, it's al uh, already more uh, moving towards something like epistemic uh, modality where uh, a speaker sort of indicates their um, evaluation of how likely uh, it is that the situation is true. Um, so um, in East Caucasian languages, uh, evidentiality is generally less grammaticalized uh, and semantically more diffuse. Um, so it focuses on marking events that are generally not witnessed by the speaker or just indirect evidentiality. Um, so here's an example from the Andic language Bhagwalal, um, where the periphrastic construction uh, of the converb and the copula uh, indicates an event in the past uh, to which the speaker had some kind of indirect access. So in Russian, these kinds of uh, constructions are often uh, paraphrased with a verb like akazvetsa, uh, so in English, something like, uh, it turns out. Um, now, Tetivosov describes two um, types of context with which um, this utterance is compatible. Um, so <clears throat> the first context is if, for example, the speaker is walking through the forest and they meet Ali, who is uh, busy cutting up a bear, uh, they can sort of think to themselves or claim that uh, it turns out that Ali killed a bear because they're inferring from uh, some kind of tangible results, the result being the dead bear. Uh, the second type of context would be if somebody else told the speaker that Ali had killed a bear while he was hunting, and then they tell um, another speaker. So when they tell this other speaker and they use this particular form, um, they're indicating that they didn't have a uh, direct access to this event. They didn't directly witness it themselves, um, but they had some type of indirect evidence. And whether this was some type of inference or um, whether it's based on hearsay, the addressee has to kind of um, retrieve or understand from the, from the context of the conversation. Um, so this type of marking, so the marking of um, more general indirect evidentiality, um, is actually quite common in Eurasia, and some also consider it an aerial feature of the Caucasus. Um, so the aim of this lecture is kind of to provide an overview of the types of evidential marking um, that are attested in East Caucasian, um, there, as well as their diachronic development, 
um, for as far as it's uh, more or less known or clear. Um, and their aerial distribution sort of within the family and within the neighborhood. Because if you look at these languages or at evidentiality in these languages from, um, from a distance, then they look quite um, stereotypical, actually. Uh, they don't really look very uh, remarkable on a larger scale. Um, but if you zoom in to the, to the Eastern Caucasus specifically, then um, there are a lot of interesting details and also a lot of uh, unre unresolved mysteries connected to this topic. Um, so the outline for this lecture is as follows. Um, first, I will uh, just give you an inventory of the types of marking that are attested. Um, followed by a brief discussion of the aerial perspective, so taking into account um, the Caucasus, but also the, the wider uh, Eurasian area. Um, then I will discuss in more detail evidentiality as part of the tent system and what kind of forms it concerns, um, followed by some dedicated particles that are tested. And I will end with a sort of summary of the main points that I will try to make throughout this uh, talk. So this is actually the, the full uh, inventory of types of forms that you can find in the East Caucasian languages to express evidentiality. Um, first of all, tense forms, in particular the perfect and other tenses that have a diachronic relationship to the perfect, uh, which express indirect evidentiality. Um, there are also some special auxiliaries derived from lexical verbs. Um, which um, they're not really part of this tense system, but they kind of follow the same, uh, this a similar pattern. Um, and their semantics are similar to indirect evidentiality, but they're not quite um, just indirect evidentiality. Um, then there are some uh, dedicated particles, most of which um, indicate infor uh, information from hearsay. And last but not least, there is some evidence that um, in Khinaluk and in Dargwa, there are um, copulas with a spatial deictic meaning, which um, also um, specify the speaker's information source or the speaker's access to an event. Um, now, at least in the case of Khinaluk, the system is essentially unresearched as far as I know. Um, if I'm not mistaken, somebody started work on this system uh, actually this year, so I'm really excited to see um, what comes out of this research. Um, and for Dargwa, there's a description of a, a copula with a meaning be here, which can be used to indicate that the speaker had um, uh, direct uh, information about an event. Um, but it's, it's not quite clear whether these forms are really evidential, so it, it requires some further um, research, but I just wanted to mention them here. So I will not be discussing these forms um, further in this talk. Um, but they're interesting because they're, um, they're the only ones actually that are quite unusual. So um, all of the other forms on the list are actually quite, um, quite common uh, in the larger area. Um, so for example, if we look at the uh, distribution of dif different types of coding of evidentiality in the languages of the world, uh, on this map from the World Atlas of Language Structure, um, you can see the contours of what is sometimes referred to as the evidential belt over here with all the red dots that are spread throughout Eurasia. Um, and as you can see, the Caucasus also forms part of this larger area you can see some red dots, some pink dots, some gray dots. Um, so that means uh, evidentiality is part of the tense system. Uh, specific verbal affixes or clitics. Uh, in some cases, they can also be diachronically related to, uh, to the tense system. And um, gray dots are mixed, which usually uh, indicates red and pink, at least in the, in the case of the Caucasus. Um, so what you can't really see at this uh, level of zooming out is that there's also some uh, absence of grammatical evidentials in the Caucasus. So even though it's very, uh, it's very common, there are also a few languages that seem to lack the, the common, common markers. 
Um, so uh, specifically in the Caucasus, uh, indirect tense forms are attested across language families. So in East Caucasian, Kartvelian, Turkic, uh, and uh, the Indo-European languages, Persian and Armenian. Uh, so this is specifically about uh, evidentiality as part of the tense system. Um, now, the attentive listener will probably have noticed that I didn't mention West Caucasian. Um, so West Caucasian languages do have some way of marking indirect evidentiality, but it has a very different um, origin uh, and it's um, typologically a little different from what we find in all of these other languages uh, spoken in the Caucasus. Now, um, as Chirikpa pointed out, um, there is a tendency in the Balkans, Caucasus, and Central Asia to hold the Turkic languages responsible for the development of the evidential category. Um, now, there are several good reasons why this hypothesis is quite um, popular. Uh, first of all, evidentiality as part of the tense system in Turkic language is a, a very prominent feature, and it's also uh, proven to be quite old. So in the oldest uh, text sources of Turkic, uh, in older descriptions, it's already mentioned. Um, and there's another reason why the Turkic languages are popular, um, a popular hypothesis for the distribution of this feature across such a, such a vast area. Um, and that is because of their uh, aerial distribution. Um, so on this map, I just took the coordinates of all the Turkic languages in the Glottolog database, and I plotted them on top of the, um, <clears throat> of the evidential map from walls. And what you get is a pretty suspicious picture where uh, everywhere you see these um, uh, red dots for evidentiality as part of the tense system, you also see um, some Turkic languages in the neighborhood. Um, at the same time, there are some problems with actually uh, proving this uh, Turkic hypothesis because it looks very convincing if you look at it at this level of abstraction, but once you zoom into a specific area and you try to connect actual forms uh, and actual donor and recipient languages, the picture sort of quickly starts to fall apart. Um, and one of the reasons for this is because um, the way evidentiality emerges within the tense system is actually quite natural. Um, and <clears throat> It's also attested outside of the Turkic contact area. You can't really see it very well um, on this map, but there are also languages outside of this area um, where it's uh, attested and um, it can occur without this contact influence. So <clears throat> if you really want to prove, oops, sorry. If you really want to prove that it's a, that it's a contact induced feature, you need some extra um, evidence. Um, so let's take a look at what these um, tense forms actually look like. Um, for a large number of East Caucasian languages, something like an unwitnessed past is described. So this is the un indirect evidential past. Um, so this is a fragment from uh, Uslar's grammar of Avar, where he describes a past completed unwitnessed, which he says is used when the speaker was not a witness uh, of that which they are talking about. So he has an example here in Avar, which uh, is translated more or less like, he was at our place today, but I didn't see him. And for the verb was, um, this uh, so-called unwitnessed past is used, which is uh, over here, which is a, a periphrastic tense consisting of a, a converb and a present tense copula. Um, now, in more uh, contemporary descriptions uh, of, of R, uh, this form is actually called the perfect. Um, so a perfect is a verb form with a current relevance function. Uh, so this means it refers to an event in the past that has some relevance at speech time. And um, one famous example is the English present perfect. So if we look at a sentence like in three, Ali has killed a bear. Um, there are two ways in which this uh, utterance could be uh, somehow relevant uh, at speech time, or this information could be relevant at speech time. For example, because there is now a dead bear, which is sort of implied by using uh, this form, or that 
Ali has this experience of having killed a bear at least once uh, in his life. Um, so how do we go from this to um, indirect evidentiality? Um, first of all, uh, it's sort of generally accepted that this meaning arises as a sort of conversational implicature. Um, so because the perfect tends to focus on the resulting situation from a past event, um, it sort of implied that the speaker had access to the results and that the event occurred in some different uh, place and time, uh, or at least in a different time. Um, and so from this, uh, you get this inferential implication. They had access to the result from which they infer the, um, the fact that the event took place. Um, further, this uh, interpretation can conventionalize. So this means that utterances with a perfect will typically carry this ki kind of inferential connotation. Um, from there, it can grammaticalize. So uh, it can expand its usage to contexts where the speaker had no direct access at all, but heard about the event from someone else. And as a result, you get this sort of general indirect evidential form that is compatible with contexts of inference and hearsay, but doesn't really specify uh, either of these types of uh, information sources. Um, so in East Caucasian, you find perfect forms in the classical sense, so uh, verb forms that um, indicate some type of current relevance across the East Caucasian family. Um, so far, I haven't seen one language that doesn't have a, a perfect form. Um, many of them have developed an indirect evidential function as well, but not all of them. Uh, and there's also a parallel tendency towards retaining the current relevance function, which um, I think is a is an, an interesting uh, fact because um, this is sort of something that the East Caucasian languages have in common also with um, local Turkic languages spoken in the area and with Persian. Um, if you compare that to Turkish, which has a, um, a sort of grammaticalized indirect evidential past with only very residual perfect uses, um, then you see kind of a small um, area within this area. Um, so as I mentioned before, the interpretation of inference as opposed to hearsay depends on the discursive context. So it has to be sort of retrieved from the, from the surrounding context. Um, but the interpretation of indirect evidentiality versus uh, current relevance in the first place depends on the semantics of the predicate. So for example, the lexical semantics of the verb, the aspect of the verb, the presence of an agent and some other parameters. And then also discursive context. Um, so for example, if we look at an uh, example with a change of state verb like uh, which means open in andi, um, if there is no agent and the verb is inflected for perfect, then you get this uh, sort of regular current relevance interpretation that the window is open or has opened. Um, now, at least in Rikwani, if you add an ergative agent, then the interpretation shifts to something like indirect evidentiality. So here you get a sort of, um, you get the famous um, first person effect that occurs with indirect evidentials when there's a first person subject because it's kind of pragmatically odd to have no direct evidence or no direct access to an event that you participated in yourself. So the resulting meaning is something like uh, the speaker did something uh, unconsciously, uh, either because they weren't aware of what they were doing or because they were um, not, not really conscious in general because they were uh, intoxicated or sleeping or something along those lines. Um, so at least in Rikwani, as soon as you uh, introduce an ergative uh, agent, you can get this uh, evidential interpretation. Um, but I would like to point out that this, uh, this parameter is kind of subject to variation. So I think this probably has something to do with different degrees of um, prominence for the indirect evidential component with respect to the current relevance component uh, of meaning. Um, because in the Zilo dialect of Andi, you can um, add an ergative agent, and then the interpretation is also a regular current relevance expression, like I've opened the window uh, with no problem. Then there are some uh, lexical verbs uh, which 
tend to be interpreted uh, in terms of indirect evidentiality when they're inflected for the perfect. So um, here's an example from Botlich where the verb yikida um, is interpreted as signaling indirect evidentiality. Um, so far, I haven't managed to um, find any current relevance uses for this particular uh, verb in Botlich. Um, I'm not entirely sure that it's completely impossible, but it doesn't seem to be the, the regular in interpretation of a perfect form of this verb. Um, now, these default readings can also be overridden. So in this example from uh, Sanjay Dargois, uh, where Sanyat has washed the dishes, the use of the um, perfect form indicates that or suggests that the speaker has some indirect evidence. In this case, for example, they infer from a wet towel and water on the floor that uh, Sanyad must have washed the dishes. Um, but if you add simply a clause that says, I saw it myself, then the evidential connotation is, um, is simply cancelled. So it's not there anymore. Um, now, Forker used this as an argument to say that the evidential meaning of the perfect uh, in East Caucasian is probably not fully grammaticalized because, um, well, it can be canceled. So to some extent, it seems to be st still a kind of implicator. Um, but the problem with this reasoning is that you can also cancel current relevance interpretations. Um, so in example nine from Bhagwalal, the speaker has caught a thief. Um, <clears throat> and in example nine, it simply indicates um, that they've caught the thief implying that they're now at the at the moment when they're saying this they're still holding the thief um, and someone should should call the police um, but as soon as you uh, add um, a definite time adverb like uh, suni which means yesterday then the interpretation shifts to indirect evidentiality so um, then you get something like yesterday i caught the thief but i didn't know he was a thief and i let him go um, where the speaker is sort of um, after the fact discovering that they had caught a thief the other day. Um, this has to do with the fact that in many languages, um, current relevance perfects are not compatible with uh, definite time adverbials. Um, this is not a, a universal feature, but in, in many languages they're not compatible. So sometimes this uh, has a similar effect. Um, now, the surest way to get rid of any sort of current relevance meaning is to use a form in, uh, in a narrative sequence. Um, so here are two verbs that when um, inflected for perfect by default, they're interpreted as resultatives. Now, I didn't want to go into resultatives too much during this talk um, because it's kind of a long story. Um, but I guess it's enough to know that resultatives are sort of the earlier diachronic stage of the current relevance perfects in East Caucasian. And many of the uh, perfects that exist now um, still uh, preserve this older resultative meaning. So um, what is important here is that these verbs, when they're inflected for perfect, sort of by default have a non-evidential meaning. Um, where they indicate a present state as the result of a past action. So uh, become tired becomes she is tired when inflected for perfect. Um, now, if you see these verbs in a narrative sequence as here, um, the interpretation of the forms is uh, basically a regular perfective past, um, but with the added uh, indirect evidential meaning. So this can only be used when the speaker is describing some events that they did not witness uh, personally. So I'd like to um, point out that this, this particular example is elicited, um, where I asked the speaker to, um, to tell a certain uh, story uh, with the idea that this was a story that was told to them by their grandmother and if they could repeat it. Um, so but there are also um, natural text examples where you get these chains of um, perfects that indicate simply uh, non-witnessed events. Um, and this type of usage is impossible with a regular current relevance perfect because the, um, the semantics of the perfect don't really allow for this uh, sequential type of, uh, of reading. So 
for example, if in uh, in English, if you make a sequence like this with the with the perfect, you get something like she has become very tired. She has sat down on a tree branch and you get this um, sort of feeling as if I'm standing right next to this person and describing their every action as it's going on. So you get this kind of sports commentary type feeling and not really a regular um, narrative um, narrative sequence of uh, events. So um, narrative use, I think, is also a good indicator of grammaticalization for the indirect evidential function. Um, because the inferential implicature with which the whole sort of chain of development usually starts is a potentially universal phenomenon. So if you really want in specific contexts, I think you can probably also uh, find it or sense it in, in English, for example, or in other uh, European languages that uh, uh, have a regular current relevance perfect. Um, and it has also been attested for uh, the lesbian perfect, for example, but then in contrast with uh, a lot of other East Caucasian languages, the lesbian perfect does not occur in, um, in narrative sequences for, uh, for unwitnessed uh, narratives. Um, so let's look at the uh, aerial distribution of the feature. Um, now on this map, um, you can see basically all of the villages where an East Caucasian language is spoken more or less, uh, and some of their neighboring languages as well. Um, and the inside circles are colored according to language and the outside circles are colored according to the presence or absence of the feature. Uh, so as you can see, we have some absence over here and some absence over here in the south where the um, where there is no uh, attested perfect with an indirect evidential meaning. Um, now, if we compare this to a map that shows um, indirect evidentiality as part of the tense system, you see that um, at least Chechen is now also uh, part of the evidential area. But here in the south, we still have quite a, a large group of points uh, where the feature is absent. Um, so I want to take a closer look now at some um, forms that are part of the tense system, but which are not um, directly uh, related to the, or which are not directly perfect. Um, so there are several uh, idioms where we find specialized forms uh, that actually might originate from perfects, but it's not quite clear. Um, these include, for example, the suffix wudi from uh, the Akhachtara dialect of Akhwach, um, which is an indirect evidential past suffix. And uh, this particular dialect of Akhwach, in addition, also has a, um, a periphrastic perfect consisting of a converb and the copula godi, um, which expresses, as far as I understand, only current relevance. Uh, so some specialization seems to have occurred here. Um, I think it's possible that the suffix woody has its origins in the same periphrastic structure, but I don't really know enough about uh, Akhwach to make a, a really uh, convincing claim. Um, now, in Sobatush, there are two suffixes, no and lo, which are homophonous with the participle and subjunctive, respectively, and which derive indirect evidential equivalence of tenses. So these suffixes are sort of attached on top of existing tenses, and then you get their indirect evidential um, equivalence. Um, I think, so in Sovatush, there is also a perfect, a regular perfect, with a, which consists of the same participle and uh, a present tense copula. And it has both current relevance functions as well as indirect evidential functions. So seeing as it's also with the same participle, I think there could be some connection there, but um, obviously, the system in Sovatush has undergone a lot of uh, complex changes that I think are not really um, attested in any other language. I haven't seen anything similar uh, in other languages of the family. So um, reconstruction, reconstructing this whole process is kind of a, a separate investigation, I think. Uh, then lastly, in Zakatala Avar, there's a, a past unwitnessed suffix la. Um, I think this could, probably this form also has some kind of perfect functions. Uh, I think it's probably an equivalent of the uh, perfect in Ovar with the, the 
Un Converb and the uh, present tense Coppola. Um, but the dialect is just not described in enough detail to really make a, uh, make a claim about that. So um, there are not a lot of examples of its usage and its semantics are not described in a lot of detail. And also I'm not sure about this suffix, um, where, it, where it comes from, what, it di what its diachronic origin could be. Um, now, as uh, Timur Masak mentioned in last week's lecture, East Caucasian languages can have very rich periphrastic paradigms. And uh, in languages where the perfect has an indirect evidential function, uh, the perfect forms of the auxiliary can form a sort of parallel paradigm or series of um, past tense forms. Um, so here's an example from Avar, where as you can see, this is just a fragment of the past tense paradigm. Uh, and as you can see, the um, pluperfect, the regular pluperfect and imperfect are formed with the aorist form of the existential verb. Um, and you have a sort of parallel set of forms uh, that differ only in the fact that they have the perfect form of the same existential verb. Uh, and these are basically the indirect evidential equivalents of the um, basic forms. Um, now, these perfect auxiliaries uh, are semantically more stable than the perfect because um, the perfect in a lot of the languages still retains current relevance functions, resultative functions, uh, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so there's always this competition between these two meanings. And since the auxiliaries are often based on uh, existential verbs, which already tend to be interpreted as evidential when inflected for perfect, um, they are semantically more stable. And as a result, they can actually outcompete the perfect as an evidential marker. Um, so I think this is more or less what has happened or what is still in the process of happening, for example, in Azerbaijani, um, which is not an East Caucasian language, of course, but it's a, um, it's a neighboring language. Um, and I think something similar also happened in uh, Chechen. So if you recall the first map I showed with the distribution of evidential perfects, you probably noticed that there was a big... Um, spot of absence where Chechen is spoken. So according to Molochieva, the perfect in Chechen does not express indirect evidentiality, at least synchronically. Um, it does have some inferential meanings sometimes, but um, it's not really an evidential marker as you find in other East Caucasian languages. Um, Chechen does, however, have uh, an unwitnessed past form, which has the structure uh, perfective converb and the auxiliary chil in uh, inflected for perfect. So to me, this looks kind of like a pluperfect form from a perfect series, because if we compare this to the um, perfect pluperfect, uh, so the indirect evidential pluperfect from Avar, um, it looks exactly the same. It even uses a, a cognate converb. Um, so yeah. Um, also, the path from pluperfect to past is uh, cross-linguistically attested, so I think it's, uh, it's technically possible. Um, but a problem with this hypothesis is that uh, other indirect forms uh, in Chechen, so there is also a, a paradigm of indirect evidential forms, uh, and they simply take different inflections of the same auxiliary, so it's not like um, the uh, perfect form of the auxiliary by itself grammaticalized as an, as an evidential marker. Uh, so it seems that the evidential sem semantics synchronically are associated with this uh, lexical verb rather than with the, uh, with the perfect form in particular. Um, now, another interesting case is Tzachur. So Tzachur does have an evidential perfect, um, but it actually has two perfects, one evidential and one non-evidential. Um, so, um, overall, Tzachur has this set of indirect periphrastic tenses, which includes the perfect, um, which is formed with the copula wood. Um, and this set is opposed to a neutral set um, with the attributive copula wodun. So in Tzachur, the entire indicative system uh, is opposed um, or has uh, regular forms and attributivized forms. And for a lot of cases, it's not quite clear um, what the difference is between the attributivized and the non-attributivized form. 
Um, contrary to what the name might suggest, it's not in terms of whether they're uh, attributive. Um, this simply refers to the fact that they are formed with an attributive marker, but um, they can also head uh, independent clauses and main clauses. Um, and yeah, it's not quite clear for many cases how they are different from the non-attributivized forms. Um, a set of forms for which it is uh, known what the difference is, is uh, the set of forms that takes the Coppola wood because they're um, opposed in terms of evidentiality. So there's one neutral set and there's one set with uh, the indirect evidential um, meaning. Um, so in this case also the evidential component is associated with the auxiliary rather than a particular tense form because the interpretation occurs specifically with the non-attributivized form of the um, auxiliary. Um, now, in their um, paper on this topic, my second tutorial also suggests that this uh, system likely originates from, uh, from the perfect in some way. Um, but here as well, um, probably uh, a fair number of intermediary steps were necessary to go from just an indirect evidential perfect to this uh, more complex uh, and more elaborate system. Um, now, another way in which evidentiality can theoretically be expressed in the tense system um, is a, in the form of a witness past. So if a perfect develops um, into an unwitnessed past, uh, and then this can trigger a reinterpretation of the general past that it's usually opposed to as a sort of witness past, so expressing direct evidentiality. Um, this is attested in uh, languages of the Nach and Sesik branches in the sense that um, the authors I cite here use the terms witness past and unwitness past to contrast um, the two forms. Um, but as uh, Forker points out, based on her data from Himur, uh, and also her analysis of the data provided by the other authors. Um, these forms are also uh, used quite frequently in contexts where there is no direct uh, witnessing involved. Uh, so she suggests that probably these forms are simply neutral uh, and they can have some kind of direct overtones in context. Um, now, I tend to side with, uh, with Forker in this regard because um, when I did some uh, field work with, uh, with Avar, for example, um, I noticed that it was also possible to get my uh, Avar consultants to um, interpret the, the Avar aorist as a, as a witness past, even though it's, it's generally considered uh, a neutral form, which occurs in a lot of contexts where it obviously doesn't really mark um, witness past. So um, now it's I think it's possible that the Nach and Sesik languages um, are different. That, for example, the the past is more the general past is more developed in the in the direction of the um, of direct evidentiality. Um, but at the same time, I haven't really seen very convincing evidence that that is really the case. So I'm still kind of wondering to what extent um, these languages uh, are really different from other East Caucasian languages in this regard. Um, now, one type of forms that I already mentioned, which is not really part of the tense system, but kind of adjacent to the tense system, uh, are cases where lexical verbs are used in the position of past auxiliaries. Um, so even though these forms are not part of the core tense system, they follow kind of similar, uh, similar patterns of uh, development. Um, so in the um, in the zone where uh, Avar is typically spoken as a as a second language, um, the verb find is used in this uh, uh, in this function, and in some Dargo varieties you find the verb stay, uh, and then there are some other auxiliaries as well. So, um, for example, find is attested in uh, Avar, several Andic languages, Sesic, Mahwab Dargwa, and Archi. Um, so, um, yeah, all languages from, from different branches of the family, but what they have in common is um, their contact with Avar as a contact language. Um, and constructions with the verb find in the past tense mark the moment of discovery. 
Um, so, for example, uh, in this example from Archie, uh, the speaker is saying that Mirza had already left, um, and the use of the verb khu, which is find, uh, indicates um, something like as I found out. Um, so here, uh, the construction describes discovery of a result, um, which is quite similar to um, marking inference. So um, the speaker sort of um, infers from the result that Mirza is gone, uh, that he has left, uh, something along those lines. Um, now, however, if you use this form with an imperfective verb, um, you don't get this type of inferential meaning, meaning but um, the interpretation is the discovery of a process, which is actually more similar to direct evidentiality. So uh, in this case, uh, the speaker encountered people tormenting a cat. So tormenting um, is in the imperfective um, and the find construction sort of uh, places the experiencer at the scene, which is essentially direct evidentiality. Um, now, this example also nicely shows that um, this construction is not completely grammaticalized yet, um, because here in the previous example, there was no expressed subject. So by default, the interpretation uh, was that the experiencer is the speaker. Um, but here we do have a, a subject uh, inflected for dative. So um, here, the find construction doesn't really refer to the um, to the axis of the speaker, but to the axis of the um, subject of the sentence. So it's not really an, an evidential in that sense. Um, now, there's another construction with the future tense of find, which marks uh, inference from reasoning. And um, <clears throat> this construction is a little bit different because um, it actually behaves more like a kind of modal, uh, modal adverb. Um, so as in the uh, translation, you see the word probably, uh, that's basically the contribution of the future tense of find in this sentence. And um, unlike the past tense of find, the future tense of find doesn't really impose uh, a future tense reading on the entire construction. So the uh, lexical verb in this case, uh, which is an imperfective, um, determines the, the tense reference of the construction. Uh, so in the uh, paper by uh, Timur Maisak and Michael Daniel, who describe these uh, constructions in a, in a lot of detail, you can see different examples um, of this construction with different uh, forms of the lexical verb. Um, and you can see that the lexical verb is the one that determines the tense reference of the construction. Um, now, these kinds of markers are kind of um, at the intersection of uh, evidentiality and epistemic modality. Uh, so epistemic modality is more about the evaluation of uh, likelihood, um, because if you use this sort of a uh, general reasoning marker, usually it also entails some kind of um, evaluation of how likely something is to, to take place. Um, so it's also, I think it's kind of on the fringes of, uh, of evidentiality semantically, um, but cross-linguistically, usually this value is considered uh, kind of a core uh, evidential, evidential value because it's usually um, expressed with forms that belong to the same paradigm as evidential markers. Um, now the stay uh, auxiliaries are tested in <clears throat> Itsari, Sanji, Kubachi, Kaitak, and standard Dargwa, so in several Dargwa varieties. And <clears throat> they actually have a similar functional range to the, to the perfect. So they express indirect evidentiality, including inference and hearsay, and if I remember correctly, they also um, inference covers both inference from result and inference from general reasoning, um, which is actually not typical for the perfect. Um, and these auxiliaries are uh, also used as a sort of narrative tense. So constructions with these auxiliaries are also used as narrative tense. Um, and that's actually a little bit surprising because um, most of these uh, idioms listed here um, also 
uh, have an indirect evidential perfect. Um, and in most East Caucasian languages, the uh, sort of default unwitnessed uh, narrative tense is the, is the perfect if it has an indirect evidential function. Um, but apparently in, this, in these idioms, uh, the stay construction can also be used in the same way, or is actually frequently used in the same way. Um, so here's an example from Kaitak Dargwa. It turned out he did not know the Quran. So um, yeah, it's quite similar to the, uh, to the construction with the, with the perfect. Um, another uh, auxiliary that is described at least to have developed into some kind of uh, evidential-like auxilo auxiliary um, is the verb become in agu. Um, and I think there are probably also other auxiliaries that are still waiting to be discovered because um, most of these constructions have been um, described in the past, I think, 10, 20 years. Um, so I think there are still many, many constructions that are undiscovered. Okay, so now that we've um, conquered the tense system, <laughs> let's move on to um, particles. Um, so a lot of East Caucasian languages have uh, particles marking reported speech. Um, many of them, I think actually probably all of them have some kind of particles mark reported speech. Um, a number of languages have several particles uh, of which the distribution and the function is not always clear. Um, however, most of these uh, particles are actually quotative. So technically they're not evidentials because um, quotative markers essentially um, mark a quotation. Um, so they can, in a way, um, refer to the speaker's access sort of by extension because they refer to a sort of um, verbal report source. Um, but quotatives can also be used to just repeat one's own words, um, to uh, quote one's own thoughts. So they don't inherently um, sort of specify the speaker's access to, to something. Um, however, quotatives can be used to form uh, a type of hearsay constructions. So um, here's an example from Bishta, where first you have a, um, a speech clause saying the chief said to Ali, um, then a quotation, uh, followed by a particle uh, and a converb uh, for misona, um, where the quotative particle basically indicates the rightmost edge of the quoted sentence. Um, so this is a fairly typical quotative, um, quotative construction. Um, now, these mar this marker can also be used um, with not with a full uh, speech clause, but with a sort of reduced speech clause, uh, such as here, where you just have nisos, which is translated as they say, because um, it doesn't have a subject. Um, and then you have the quotation, and then klo, and then again nisona. So you get this sort of uh, it's still kind of a quotative construction, but it's kind of an impersonal quote. So it's already moving closer towards um, a hearsay construction. Um, now, something else that is possible in Bishta is the following, where you just have a, a general statement uh, followed by the same marker klo, and then you get a, a regular hearsay meaning. So he went home, they said, um, where there is no, uh, no speech clause uh, necessary, and you get this more um, generic uh, hearsay expression. Um, now, this is quite similar to what we find in other East Caucasian languages that do have a sort of um, dedicated hearsay marker. So here's an example from Botlich, where the particle Hwata indicates that the statement is based on hearsay. So you get something like Zini hik abuku Hwata, means a cow fell down, it is said. Um, so even though this looks quite similar to the construction in Beshta, which I just uh, showed, um, first of all, in Botlich, um, Hwata has only this function. So if you want to make a quotative construction, you would need a different particle. 
Uh, and second, I'm not sure to what extent the marker Klo in Bishta can do this, but in uh, Botlich at least, the particle can sort of move around in the clause uh, to mark focus on a different constituent. So um, its default position is kind of at the end of the sentence uh, on the verb, um, but it's essentially uh, flexible. So in example 22, the particle is on, uh, on the cow, uh, so it puts some kind of emphasis on the cow. But at the same time, uh, the scope of the, of the hearsay particle is still over the entire uh, clause that it occurs in. Um, so yeah, as I just mentioned, Botlich has a separate morphine talu for a quotation. Uh, and this talu always appears at the right edge of the quotation and cannot be moved to mark focus. So this is a more classic um, quotative device. Um, dedicated hearsay markers are actually relatively rare. So they're tested in only um, seven languages so far uh, as compared to uh, 24 evidential perfects uh, or indirect evidential perfects in total. Um, I think this is probably due to, um, to a descriptive gap. So um, in general, discursive particles are kind of an underdescribed word class for uh, East Caucasian languages. Usually, um, a lot of descriptive grammars just have a, a list of, of particles that is usually not exhaustive, and the description of their functions is usually quite brief, uh, and it doesn't really cover all of their possible uh, meanings. Um, so I think um, for, for this topic, um, I think we need more data to understand how common these markers really are and to really do a good comparison of um, where you have dedicated particles and where uh, the marker is actually a quotative that can occur in these sort of impersonal and, and hearsay constructions. Um, so a common source of reported speech markers uh, in East Caucasian, as well as just worldwide, uh, cross-linguistically, uh, are uh, not, su not surprisingly speech verbs, um, but in particular, uh, converbal forms are, are very common, uh, at least in this particular area. So in some languages, uh, full verbs are still used as a type of reported speech particle. So in uh, Sanji Dargwa, there are two of these particles, um, which are essentially the, uh, the imperfective converb of one speech verb and the perfective converb of another speech verb, um, but they're used in much the same way as the um, as the particles uh, in Bishta and uh, and Botlich. Um, now it's it's kind of unclear if the hearsay and quotative markers are diachronically related. So if you look at the Bishta examples um, uh, one after the other, then it seems quite logical that. Um, hearsay markers would diachronically originate from uh, quotative markers. Um, but I think it's also possible um, in languages where there is actually a, a dedicated hearsay marker. Usually it looks kind of different from the, um, from the quotative marker in the sense that it's likely to um, have originated from maybe the same uh, speech verb, but perhaps a different converbal form that has specialized for a specific function. So it's not quite obvious that they went on uh, sort of one diachronic path. Maybe they were just two sort of parallel uh, paths of development. Um, and these kinds of particles could actually also be a Turkic contact feature. So they're quite common. Um, so in Turkic languages, you also quite commonly find um, reported speech markers uh, that uh, either originate from, from a converbal form of a speech verb or just are full uh, verb forms, uh, as in Sanji Dargwa. Um, so it's possible that this is also a, um, a borrowed, borrowed feature. Um, now, there's as far as I know, there's one language that actually has an indirect evidential particle, uh, which is the language Chris. Uh, and Chris copied the clitic mush from, from Aziri. Uh, so most likely, uh, for those of you who are a little bit familiar with Aziri morphology, uh, this is a copy of the copula imush um, and not of the perfect suffix mush. Um, because the perfect suffix uh, mush in um, 
Azerbaijani would be uh, a very poor model for borrowing the uh, evidential semantics because it has largely lost these, this meaning uh, at the current stage. Um, and also the clitic in, in Chris uh, attaches to different verb tenses, so it behaves more like the, the copular particle uh, in uh, Azeri, and it marks general indirect evidentiality. Um, a similar copy is also attested in Tat, which is an Iranian language spoken in the same area. And um, Winfried Böder actually suggested the same thing that this is, it, the suffix looks the same. So uh, first thought would be that it might be a copy of the uh, perfect suffix, but in terms of its uh, distributional characteristics and its semantics, it's more likely that it's a copy of the, uh, of the copula. Um, now, so far, this is the only known case of uh, evidential matter borrowing in uh, East Caucasian. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> this, is the, this is actually, uh, as a result, also the only confirmed case of any evidential borrowing uh, period. Um, so there's one East Caucasian language that actually positively lacks any type of evidential marking, and that is Udi. So um, in the case of Udi, it's not very likely that this is due to a lack of description. So there are a few other language, languages for which um, there is no record of an uh, indirect evidential tense or a particle or something. Um, but for those languages, we have less data. So I don't feel really comfortable claiming uh, that they don't have evidentiality period um, because I think they actually might have, um, it's just not described yet. But in the case of Udi, I think we can be pretty certain uh, that it's not there uh, because Udi is one of the more well-studied uh, languages. Um, so I think if it had an evidential marker, then uh, these authors would have um, discovered it for sure. Um, there's also no evidence for evidentiality in Caucasian Albanian either. So um, Caucasian Albanian is the oldest attested uh, East Caucasian languages, language um, for which we have some, some written record. And uh, it's an, an ancestor of uh, either Udi or its sister language. Um, so it's not an ancestor of the entire family because it's not old enough, um, but just for one specific branch. Um, Based on this, it might seem attractive to suggest that probably evidentiality as a category is a, a borrowed feature in East Caucasian. Um, but this still leaves, um, the, the data that we have still leaves a lot of uh, options open. So as I mentioned before, at least in the TEN system, uh, the feature can occur quite uh, naturally. Um, so it's also possible that several centuries ago, some language like Avar sort of spontaneously developed the feature and then uh, spread it to, um, to neighboring languages, for example. Um, so yeah, I'm also already actually at my summary. So I think <laughs> we will um, finish a little bit uh, early today, um, unless you have a lot of questions. Uh, so, uh, overall, the East Caucasian languages are fairly typical of the general area where they are spoken, at least in this respect. Um, and evidentiality is part of the tense system, uh, typically originates from the perfect. Um, so, at least so far, I haven't seen any cases where it definitely doesn't originate from the perfect. There are just a few cases left where it's not confirmed yet that the system also diachronically originates from the perfect, um, but I haven't seen any convincing counter uh, examples where something completely different is happening. Um, that is until some more detailed research about Chinook will be available with the, the Deictic copulus. Um, so this, this feature, so indirect evidentiality as a meaning of the perfect is widespread among the languages of the family, but not universal. Um, it's notably absent in the southern part of the area. Um, so I didn't really, um, I didn't put the whole uh, question of um, the aerial distribution 
uh, with respect to language contact in this uh, presentation because I was afraid I didn't I wouldn't have time to discuss all of this because it's kind of a complicated story. Um, so I'm hoping there may be some some questions about this so that I can uh, elaborate on this a little bit more anyway, um, because it's kind of strange that you have the specific area uh, within the area where the feature is just seems to be absent, uh, whereas it's incredibly common in the entire uh, surrounding area. Um, as I already mentioned, there's also a tendency to preserve the current relevance function alongside uh, evidentiality, which I think could be a sort of shared feature um, or like a shared aerial feature with uh, Persian and the uh, local Turkic languages like Azerbaijani and Kumwik. Um, dedicated hearsay or evidential particles seem relatively rare, uh, which is likely due to a descriptive gap and uh, they show no clear aerial signal. So I didn't show you a map because it was kind of messy, um, simply because there is not enough uh, data about this type of marking. Uh, specialized auxiliaries from lexical verbs like stay and find it are also tested, which is basically um, all I can say about them. <laughs> um, they're tested in specific groups of languages, um, and probably there are more similar items uh, in other languages of the family, but they're still waiting to be discovered. Um, now, one last thought I want to, I would like to express is that the basic inventory of evidential markers in uh, East Caucasian languages uh, includes three types of forms with overlapping semantics, which seems a little bit redundant. So of course, not all of the languages have all of the available forms, um, but some of them do. For example, avar has a, um, a, a bunch of indirect evidential tenses. It also has a hearsay particle, and it has a defined auxiliary, which um, is used in the perfective past as a sort of, uh, also as an indirect evidential marker. And so far, we don't really know um, how these forms are uh, distributed. So um, yeah, they overlap to a great, great extent. Uh, in terms of their semantics, and it's not quite clear why these languages would need so many means to specify that they didn't um, witness something personally, and uh, and how these are distributed in, in different types of contexts. Um, so, uh, yeah, Barkala, thank you for, for listening. Um, I thought I would... Um, honor the tradition of my colleagues by also showing a picture of my uh, fieldwork site. So this is the village of Botlich. You can see Botlich on the right here. And here you can see a very typical view for Botlich, which are fruit trees, because as you can probably also tell from the picture, Botlich is uh, located in the mountains, but it's not a uh, not really a highland village, it's only at a uh, thousand meters of altitude. So uh, the climate is quite nice and you can grow uh, apricots and peaches and all sorts of other uh, tasty stuff there. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. That was my uh, presentation. Chiara, shall I stop sharing my screen now? Yeah, thank you Samira for your interesting talk. Now I will, then I will share mine. There are some, some questions and some comments. Uh-huh. All right. Can you see my screen? Uh-huh. Um... Okay, so what do you think the Russian Dagestanian construction with Akazovets, uh, it turns out, apparently common among L2 speakers of Russian Dagestan is equivalent to in their L1s? Um, wouldn't that depend on the L1? That's a good question. Um, yeah, so yeah, I think, uh, I think it's probably equivalent to the perfect. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure, of course, this would require a separate study, but just because the perfect is the most frequent uh, marker of this type of meaning. So I think that's probably the equivalent. Um, 
Um, so Tatiana asks whether evidentiality marking is obligatory across East Caucasian. Um, well, that's kind of a difficult question. So I think um, almost all of the systems that I've seen um, have an indirect evidential marker opposed to a neutral marker. So if you don't want to uh, use an evidential marker, usually you can. So there are certain contexts where it's um, kind of um, very um, regular, um, but it, it's not technically um, obligatory. Um, so yeah, you can always, if you want to, you can always avoid it. Um, yeah. Does find have a mirative function? That's a good question, but um, I think, um, yeah, I guess you could in interpret it as something similar to mirativity, um, just as you can do that with a lot of markers that have an, an inferential meaning, um, because usually inferential markers um, mark a kind of, uh, also a kind of moment of discovery. So I think actually the description by Timur Maisak and Michael Daniel of this specific uh, construction as, a, as marking the moment of discovery is actually the, the best way to describe it. So this has some mirative feel to it, but it's not quite, um, yeah, it, it's not quite grammatical mirativity in any case. Um, okay, so I see a comment from uh, Gilotier that Boudouk has a separate particle. Uh huh. Um, yeah, I'm aware that Boudouk has a separate particle. Um, I'm just not sure of the of the exact function of the particle, so I didn't mention this. Um, I wouldn't say current relevance of the event's results implies having no access to the event itself. Um, yeah, of course, there are many. Um, Mm, yeah, okay, that's a, that's an interesting thought. Um, however, um, to be honest, uh, if I, like, I don't know anything about cars. If I say, I fixed the car, I might think that this is some kind of, um, yeah, I don't know. It would also be some kind of um, indirect, um, interpretation. Um, wait, maybe I don't understand this comment entirely. Um, but yeah, overall, I agree with you. It would be interesting to look at first singular context in general for, for evidentialization. I think in general, um, um, it would also be interesting to look at the presence of an agent um, because uh, from what I've noticed, uh, at least in, in uh, East Caucasian, um, constructions without an agent are easily interpreted as uh, current relevance, and with an agent, it's kind of different. In a lot of cases, it will uh, always have this sort of evidential interpretation. Um, not all East Caucasian languages have many periphrastic forms. Um, yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, yeah. Um, okay, so here we have an example from, ah, I think this is about the find construction from a particular Dargwa dialect. Okay, got it. Um, uh-huh, Udi also lacks any quotative markers. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, this is interesting. Um, I don't think I've seen Schultz's unpublished functional grammar of Udi. Um, so yeah, this would be interesting to, to look at. Thank you. Okay, so maybe I will stop sharing my screen and see if there's some other questions. Okay. No, I think I think we covered all the questions. <laughs>
So thank you very much, Samir, for this interesting talk. And take, thank you, everyone, for taking part uh, in our uh, lecture today. Uh, see you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.